I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. give all glory, all honor, and all praise to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the awesome privilege of coming together and worshiping God another time. I don't know what your week's been like. I don't know what happened today. All I can say is without fear of contradiction is God is good. I know we can all Concur that God is good. Right now, I'm telling someone, no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter what it is that's confronting you, as long as you can cry out that name, that name of Jesus, there's power in that name. She needs you to pray with me this morning. I solicit your prayers. It's a tough message today, but it's accurate. It's something that I know God wants us to understand uh, about this dispensation that we are in. So I want you to bow your heads and just pray. Father God, again, we have come trusting and believing in your power. Come to worship and thank you for what you've done. I come now, God, to get back on track, to be restored, to be helped. Lord, I pray that someone watching who is down to their last, will know there is a supernatural power called the Holy Spirit that can lift them up and take them to another place. God, I ask you to guide, lead, and direct in this message. Take my mind off of me and put it solely on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me, if you will, to the gospel according to Luke chapter 7. The gospel according to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to be reading King James, but I'll also be talking a little of the uh, American Revised Standard Version and the NIV as we go. But let me read this. Go with me down to verse 36. You have it? Amen. Let's read. What a powerful word. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with her hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one he owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast judged rightly. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gave me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto her, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. 
And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I want you to write this thought down. It's a powerful thought. Uninvited guests are welcome. Uninvited guests are always welcome. This, this, this is strange as I think about the power of God uh, in this text. But I was seeking God this week over a very serious matter that's going on in my family. And I was in my prayer closet. And it was one of those moments where I was completely surrendered to God. Have you ever been there where everything is serene? It's like the problems don't matter. The things around don't matter. I was right there with God. And I was so close and I. I was close enough to know that I was in communion with him. But right then, the Holy Spirit spoke something strange into my spirit. And as I was worshiping, the Holy Spirit said, God has been patient with you. Wow. And I think I know I know some people don't know if that's something to make you shout and tremble, but when I think back over my life and when I think back over the things that God has allowed me to get through, escape through, and come through. Those were shouting words. There were trembling words. I was a little afraid because he had told me, wow, God's been patient with me. Can I reverse that on you and let you know that you need to understand yourself. God has been patient with you. There goes. There, there's a place for a hallelujah right there. God has been patient because you know and God knows what has gone on. But I thought about it. You're right. God is long suffering and patient. God always seems to find a way to bless us. You know what I mean? That God has found some things God has found some things in our life that he knows are stopping us or blocking us from getting where he wants us to go. So he does some things. So here's what made me shout. God has given us principles and he's given us um in his word, he's given us some promises, and we take those, and we read those, and we study those, and yet, nothing changes. We start hollering as soon as we get in the fix, we, we go into the same motions every time, and God, then, not only does God give us promises, he, he, he also gives us directions. We wouldn't have went to half of the stuff we went through, and we would allow God to lead us. And God, if somebody y'all know what I'm talking about right there, can you say amen? If you would have listened to what you know God said, you wouldn't have gotten into some of that trouble. But here is what really shows you the heart of God or shows you how much God loves you. Listen to me. That shows you that God is continually has a plan, a divine plan, that he's working in your life. Because no matter how many times I don't follow, no matter how many times God has to come in, he never gets mad enough to throw me away. Isn't that something? God never quits on us. God never stops on us. He doesn't get mad and say, I'm through with them. And we've done some stuff to make God mad enough to say that. No, what God does, he finds another way to bring my life back into alignment with his blessings. Watch this, y'all. Somebody can shout right now because what you're going through might just be a time when God is aligning your life back up with where your life should be. Did you get that? Here's what God is saying. He aligns our life back with him. How does he do it? When I don't change, he calls a situation to come into my life that has me coming to him, yielded, tears coming down. And the situation may seem horrible, but how many of you know God turns the situation around for our best? Because what he does is he brings me back into alignment by making me face something that I have to pray about, and it draws me back to him. And I come back just in time to get that next blessing. God is that on time God. That is awesome. Not only does God do that, God also takes us to a position where he can make us stronger by showing us another perspective for what we're going through. You know what I'm saying? If you go through and the doctor said there's no way and you're fearful about it, or you get a situation where it looks like you don't have the funds to handle it, or you get in a situation where you're going through some struggles, what God does is allow us to go through those struggles. Somebody ought to praise God for going through them already. You've been through some stuff. And when you go through those struggles, he makes me strong enough that the present struggle I'm in seems to be nothing because he took me through the other struggle. You know what I'm saying? There was a time when something overwhelmed me. But when God sent something that strengthened me, now what I used to get me down, the 
don't get down anymore because God has found a way to strengthen me and bring me back. Hallelujah, somebody. God wanted me to speak that word into somebody's heart. You can't face it because of what you already came through. And then finally, how does God do that? God sends a person to talk to us. He, he sends a person when we can't hear him or we don't change. He sends that right message so we can get it. It's astounding to me how God does this. And all of a sudden he says, heed that word. And when we heed that word, we find out that we're not where we thought we were or doing what we thought we were doing. It, it, it's like Nathan coming before David after he had slept with Bathsheba and after he had killed Uriah. You remember David thought he was still all right with God. Sometimes we think we're all right with God because we walk so much in God's grace that we forget that we should be closer and climbing to get closer every day. We think we're all right, all right. I said we're all right. That's how we feel. But God is saying, no, some things you got to be accountable for. And what he did is sent Nathan, and Nathan told David this story about this raw, unkind, dark act this man did. David said, where is the man? Who is he? And he had to tell him, it's you. God sends situations or people to make us see we're not where we are supposed to. I know somebody know what I'm talking about. And that's why God sent me on assignment this morning to share with you one of the long-standing problems in the church. To share with you a problem he's trying to get us to stop doing is something that stops people from getting saved. It's something that stops our personal walk to holiness. It's something that stops us from having joy in our trials. Here's what God said. Let me put it this way so you can feel me. Um, there are a lot of things churches are good at. God's church. Some churches are good at singing. Some churches are good at praying. Some churches have dynamic preaching. Some churches have uh, their givers. Some churches are servers. Whatever it is, we're good at all kinds of things. But there's one thing every church is good at, and it's killing the church. Here it is. Drum roll, please. We love to judge other people. I don't care how long we've been saved, we become professional judges. We know exactly how people should walk. We know how people should worship. We know what people should say. We know when leaders mess up. We condemn the leader. We condemn the church. We condemn everybody around us because we have a right to judge. I don't know what it is. You can only be saved a hot minute. You ain't been in church for five quick weeks and all of a sudden you done cornered the market on the Holy Ghost so you can point to people and say, you can point to people and say you can judge them. Oh, uh, we, we got these three little words down. There's three or four. That ain't right. Yeah, that ain't right. Now, if you are, uh, you know, proper, you might say, that's not right. That's that. What they're doing is not right. All I'm telling you is, all of us somehow have gotten to the point where we mess up God's church by judging and condemning other people. And when we judge them, we crucify them. And God's church gets all tangled uh, and the problem, the problem is, the irony is, you're trying to tell somebody how to live, and some days you can't even live your own life right. The problem is, you're trying to tell somebody how to stay holy, and God just got done taking you out of a situation. You don't have to pray with me. You're trying to tell somebody, this is good, that's good, but you totally ignore what's going on around you, because judges can't be worshipers, and we just judge people until God says, wait a minute, I got to tell you the consequences. I got to tell you, listen to me today, I'm talking about something that we all have faced. Listen, I have judged people. Some of y'all have judged me. I have judged you. All I'm saying is when we do that and we keep that judgment going, it destroys God's house. And all of a sudden, there's people who find themselves uninvited guests into God's own house. They were sitting here. I know somebody don't want me now. Pray with me. They were sent to be members, but they leave out. They were sent to be worshipers, and they leave out. But they weren't leaving out. They got driven out by somebody judging. Because after we judge, we go into the area where their lives are uncomfortable, and it makes us feel good. But I need to tell you first, the Bible is full of reasons we should not judge each other. Write this down, Matthew chapter 7. If you would go there with me, the first and second verse tells us, do not judge, NIV, others, or you will be judged. 
And the same measure, Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2, that you use will be measured to you when they judge you. Here is what God is saying in Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2. He said, soon as you judge me, you just judge yourself. Oh, my God. As soon as you open your mouth against me, you just open a door that says you're going to get judged. I don't know about you, but I got some skeletons in my closet. Don't act like you don't. Don't act like you're perfect. There's not no perfect people out there, but there's skeletons in all of our closet. And as long as we keep the spirit of judgment, we're going to keep the anointing of God from flowing. You don't have a right to judge anybody else. So the first thing we see in Matthew is you become a judge. You judge yourself. So the first consequence of judging is as soon as you judge me, you're going to get judged. Come right back around to you. Luke 6, 37 says the same thing, but it takes it a little further. It shows you the cycle that happens with judgment. Are you with me? Luke 6, 37 says, uh, judge not so you won't be judged. Watch this. Condemn not so you won't be condemned. And he said, forgive so you can be forgiven. Judge not. Condemn not. Forgive so you can be forgiven. I'm trying to tell you why there's so many hurting powerless people in the church because somehow we have found this soapbox of, of pharisaical self-righteousness that we use on everybody and I don't know how you fix your mouth to tell me I'm not right when you're dealing with your own stuff. But here's what it says. Here's how it starts. First it starts with judging. You know what judging is? You look at me and make an assumption that you know about me, that you know my fights, you know my worries, you know my struggles when you don't even know it. And you judge me and put me in this category. And all of a sudden, you got a nerve to tell other people about it. That's called condemning. That's the next step. Condemn. Then we condemn. And then after you condemn, you walk around for years with unforgiveness in your heart. And you wonder why. Then you get startled when, you, when your life has to deal with these same judgments, this same condemnation, this same forgiveness. Because when we don't forgive, we find ourselves, we're, you know what churches are doing? We're tiptoeing around each other because we don't want nobody to say nothing bad about us. Man, forget that. Long as you live, somebody's not going to like what you do. But you have to line your life up with God. But you got to make sure you don't judge. Not only do you find a consequence if you start judging yourself, you start walking around like a hypocrite. Yes, you do. Uh, Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, NIV, you who are spiritual, if you see your brother take a fall, restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Watch out lest you fall into condemnation. And it says you got to do it. Oh, thou hypocrite. Oh, thou hypocrite. When you can judge somebody else, when you don't restore them, you're a hypocrite. Why a hypocrite, Pastor? Because you sure want God to restore you. You still want God to restore you. So it's saying that you become here. So the second thing is now you forget or you miss God's purpose for your life. When you start judging other people, you miss what God is saying he wants. I got to get into this text. This is powerful. I want you to know I'm going to give you some points in here. But I need you to know that the last consequence, which is the most deadly consequence of judging, is Matthew 7, 3 through 5. Here's a good one. NIV. Um, how can you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when there's a plank in your eye? It says, why don't you first take the speck out of your eye? How can you tell your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a plank in your eye. First take the plank out of your eye, then get the speck out of your brother's eye. All God is trying to get you to see my my shortcomings, my failures, my fault can't become your preoccupation. When you do that, you have, I got a little toothpick in my eye. You got a big, long plank of wood in your own eye. God said, when you are a judger, you find yourself dealing with consequences that lead you away from him. There's three things you got to do to be a judge. I'm going right to the text. You know what you got to do? The first thing you do is you got to forget where you came from. Uh-huh. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't sit up here, act like you've always been, you know, whatever your title is, bishop, apostle, usher, choir member, singer, I don't care what it is in the church, even since you've been that, you have messed up. Somebody say amen to me. So how do you want to, when you forget where you come from, you have no, no compassion on anybody else. But if you can sit back and look at me like you ain't never made a mistake, then just somebody. But I know we all have our own past. So the first thing you got to do is judge, you got to forget where you go. 
Now you got to forget what you've been through. Come on. You better thank God that when you were a mess, God didn't judge you and leave you. How many of us will confess there were times I was a mess even in the house of God? There was a time when I made a mess in the house of God. There were times when I act like a mess in the house of God. But you know what God did? He allowed his blessing to keep going through my life. Somebody shout amen. God blessed you and you still won't thank God for somebody else when they're turning into a mess. You want to condemn them. And the last thing is you got to forget who, who is going. You really are. Can I tell y'all? Yeah, some folk might have judged me. And yeah, there's some shortcomings inside of me. But I'm, I'm telling you, I'm trying to do the best that I can. But here's what I want you to know. Every day there's a me inside of me that I have to surrender to God that I don't like. If you be an honest person, aren't you shocked sometimes how the real you, not the speaking in tongues you, not the shouting around the church you, not the oh how blessed God, God is good all the time you. Where is the you that struggles through your own sinful ways? Where are you that struggle through some BC stuff that still comes back in your life? Where are you that struggle for the same thing over and over and over again? You know where you are? You're safe in God's arms. You better quit trying. How dare you judge somebody else? Until you understand where you came from, what you've been through, and who you... I know who I really am. And some days, I am not past the dump. I got to pray. I got to line up. Come on, somebody go with me. And so, I don't need you judging me when I fall. God said we're supposed to do the opposite. We're supposed to restore. We're supposed to trust. We're supposed to bring people back. But we've got so hooked on judgment that we can't do it. That's why this text is so important. This woman in the text was a known sinner. She was, commentaries say, a prostitute. Lady of the night. But everybody was, she was well known around the town according to the text. And here this woman saw that Jesus had come to dinner somewhere and she came into the house and when she got into the house, she ran over to see Jesus. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the religious leader, uh, we found out that his name is Simon in verse 40. The church folks said, what is that person that I just judge not to be worthy doing in the church? Oh, Lord, my God, oh, my God. Oh, my. We go into all kinds of crazy stuff and we start judging people. And Jesus was holding her. But we were saying she was uninvited. This text is important because we don't just hurt church folk. Here's where we are in this dispensation, in a, pre, a post-pandemic church, in a church where the culture has shifted and sexual orientation is accepted. Shacking up is part of all the legal system where same-sex marriage, where uh, being gay or fornicating, all the things we like to judge people are, uh, uh, addicted to drugs, all of those things are prevalent in our society. And now we're stopping folks to come to church, but they come in our church and we tell them, we don't want you in here. We make them uninvited guests when God invited them in. Can I talk to you now? Are you with me? This text is about God showing us how we can get that monkey off our back of this up and down salvation. I'm telling somebody right now, but you realize because your whole life you've been, you've been given the ministry of judgment and because of that you have not been able to get anything from God consistently because you love to judge other people. I'm going to give you three points and I'm starting the first point right here in the text. This chapter, uh, chapter 7, this chapter of action and insight. Action, because Jesus starts his ministry in, this, in two chapters before this. And insight, because it gives us insight into kingdom power. How many know if it wasn't for the power of God? I'm talking about real kingdom power. God has some folks who are listening or looking or watching and would say, I felt that real power of God. I felt God's power in my bedroom. I felt God's power in my hospital room. I felt God's power when I asked a promise and I didn't know how he was going to do it. Somebody said God is real. Old folks said my God is real. And all I know is that some of us out here that realize I'm in this world but I'm seeking and living through the power of God's kingdom. We are kingdom people. But you can't be a true kingdom person. Jesus is trying to show us over and over again if you judge other people. Fourth chapter of this gospel in Luke he had gone into the wilderness to be tested. Fifth chapter, he started healing. His ministry of healing. 
sixth chapter, he was going out and engaging, engaging with the scribes and Pharisees. Watch this. Isn't it something when God's power starts coming and working that it's not the outside folk that mess up God's power, but it's the people right here in the church? And so he had to go and deal with all of the religious leaders. And that took him to this seventh chapter, where in this seventh chapter, he started out. It is so powerful. He healed the centurion's uh, servant. And when he healed the centurion's servant, he gave us insight. Here's a, here's a tip for you. Somebody get this. Faith moves God. He said, I haven't seen so great faith. You may not be the perfect person. That's what this text is about. But because you have faith, I'm telling you. Sat down by Jesus, and all of the church 
church folk started looking. Mm, mm. We found it. We found something we could judge and not get our blessing. And we run people away from church. I was working at uh, the Board of Ed, and I was a social worker on the child study team. This teacher came to me after school and said, there's this boy, he comes to my class, he stinks it up. Every day he's funky. He comes in and he's late every day to school, middle school. They had to walk to school. She said, he's late every day, and, he's, and kids call, call him all kind of names, and he just disrupts my class. So she said, I want you to go to the house tomorrow morning, and because this boy ain't like he don't want to be here. And he might not, must not be following, you know, his parents or whoever taking care of him because he comes in late every day and he's, and he's dirty and no hygiene. I can't take it anymore. So I went out. Next morning, early, got to the boy's house, knocked on the door. When he opened the door, he ran, wiping the sleep out of his eyes. Nothing but his underwear on. He said, oh, Mr. Duncan, I, I'll, be, I'll be right there. So I come to get you for school. Come on, get ready. And he said, okay. And I'm looking. He said, watch it. Because when I stepped in, there was a big hole by the front door. That if you just step wrong, you step down into the hole. And while the boy was running in the room, I looked and noticed there was a man, an older man, inebriated. He had the bottle still in his hand. You could tell he was sleeping off and intoxicating drunk. I looked over there. There was a woman who was half clad. As a matter of fact, I, I, I did one of these numbers and just put the covers up on her. She was standing around there kind of naked. And there was a woman sitting in there. And then I happened to look where the boy was. He was digging in an old dirty clothes basket full of dirty clothes. He'd pull them out, he'd smell them, and then he'd throw them on. After he got those clothes on, he went into the bathroom. I could see where he was to wipe his face. He picked up an old rag. looked like it had been used. It was dirty. Wiped his face. Then he ran past. He said, I'm ready, Mr. Duncan. He said, wait a minute. And he went to the refrigerator and opened it. When I looked in the refrigerator, there was so much, there was molded stuff in there. Nothing looked safe. I told him, look, I'm going to get you some breakfast. So on the way to school, I stopped to a store and I bought him two outfits of clothes and I bought him some food and I took him into the school and I took him to the nurse's office and I asked the nurse, can you, can you let him wash here and give him these clothes and, and, and those other clothes I told him, well, we need to throw them away. He said, okay. And he got the new clothes and he was just a gentle, gentle soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I went back to the teacher and I explained the situation to the teacher. You know the teacher? She said, oh, I didn't know. I said, not only were you wrong, that he didn't want to come here. You were totally wrong for judging him about coming here because what he, what he was doing was making his way here through all the obstacles. It's where he wanted to come. And you were dead wrong about his caretakers because nobody was caretaking him. He was doing it himself. When you judged him, you just made it worse. You allowed the kids to pick on him. and a play, He was coming to school, the place he thought, if you'd have seen that house, that was going to be safe. He was coming to people he thought were going to love him. He was coming to a place where he thought he'd be accepted and he didn't find it. And just like that teacher, church folk need to understand that some people, when they come in here, they're on Jesus let her 
touch him, and he touched her. You guys know big deal? Mm. You must have never been touched by Jesus when everybody else rejected you. You must have never been touched by Jesus when you rejected yourself. You must have never been touched by Jesus when your world was falling apart. But you, 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 you went into a corner somewhere and you found a connection. I'm looking at what this woman did. This is so powerful. Someone ought to know that it just means whatever I've done makes no difference to Jesus. I'm still welcome. Now let me stay there. We've done a whole lot of stuff. But she touched Jesus because she just knew instinctually, somewhere, Jesus would not care. And then sitting there with every eye on her. Can you imagine? They're all talking to this woman. What is she coming? What is he doing? What is Jesus doing? And all of a sudden, she cried. She wiped it. She cried. She wiped it. Because when you've been touched by Jesus, you have to worship. You wonder why some of us get so excited in worship. Because number one, we know we're not worthy. Number two, we've seen worship heal our houses, heal our children. Anybody with me heal our body? We've seen worship. When I'm speaking in the name of Jesus, when I'm speaking through a praise, I've seen worship change my very uh, insides. I saw God take me out of a heavy depression and send me to a place of victory just through worship. And I did that because I already been touched and I knew that he would touch me again. And that's how God blesses us. And after you've been touched, you have to worship. She took the bottle, alabaster box. Alabaster was just a stone, like white marble. And they used to make these nice containers for women to wear around their neck. And they would put anointed oil or perfume in your, or perfumed oil inside the bottle. And it was a very precious stone. This woman took the best she had and gave to Jesus. That's all God said I honor. And then all of a sudden, the second point, they are not coming to crash our party. They're coming for Jesus. But now we don't want them. We want them gone. They came, look for Jesus. We want them gone. Look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, he started speaking. Jesus must not know. He must not be a prophet. He must not know. Listen to me. Do you understand? That's how judgmental people judge you. They make you think they're speaking for Jesus. Oh, I'm preaching. They make you think that they heard some, some voice telling them that they're on the right plane and everything you're doing wrong. They can judge what church is good, what church is bad, what preacher is good, what choir member is good. They can judge everybody but themselves. Start speaking for Jesus. Jesus must not know. I got to get her out of here. Jesus must not know. He does know. He sent them here. Did you catch that? When a person comes to your church and they're and they're not dressed like you dress and walk like you walk and do what you want. It's because God sent them there. Commentary say this lady must have met Jesus before she got to the house of Simon because she was in there thanking God, praising God because she knew she had been forgiven. We don't know whether Jesus touched her earlier. All we know is that Jesus said she can come in. While you're deciding to throw people out, watch me that Jesus sent to your church. And you do it because I speak for Jesus. We have the truth. And God is in glory crying. Because you just ran somebody out that may commit suicide. You ran somebody out that there's a generational reaction where a child won't be saved because you shunned the mother. You said you messed somebody up before they could even find God's forgiveness. You ran them out of your church. We want them gone. Remember in John 8, just so that I don't be crazy around me, um, we say stuff like, uh, well, this is wrong and that is wrong. I know everything that they're doing is wrong, right? That's not how God's arithmetic works. If God added up stuff to keep us saved, all of us be kicked out. No, what God said. Remember John 8, when a woman was caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus? There was no doubt about it. She was caught in adultery. But when she got to Jesus, um, all of them, because they were the righteous ones, they had rocks in their hand. And when they told Jesus what the woman had done, that's where we are. We like to tell Jesus, they're not right. Jesus looked and said, he lives without sin. Cast the first stone. Watch me. 
I'm, 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 I'm disarming judgmental people out of your life right now. I'm setting you free from them. Because the truth be told, the same people judging you, if they stood before God, they got to drop their rocks. Jesus said, I'm not interested in what she did. I'm interested that the fact that she now is with me and I can do the impossible. He said, this woman is sitting at Jesus' feet weeping and all of a sudden Jesus says, Simon, let me tell you something. I like Jesus. See, Jesus can read minds. He read Simon's mind. He said, let me tell you. He said, let me give you this little parable. He said, it was a debtor and one owed this much, two people owed this man and one owed this much, one owed this much. He said, and one was more and one, then one was less. I want you to see it. And then he said, he forgave both of them. Which one will love him best? And Simon said, well, I suppose the one that he forgave the most. He said, you answered right. Can we go to our last point? Look at this text. God loves the biggest, those who have the biggest debt. Okay? Come on, come here. Listen to me. You are not high, anointed, holy, and righteous because you came out the womb high, anointed, holy, and righteous. You're high, holy, and righteous because you were a hell raiser in the world. Because you did stuff in the world that God had to take out of your soul. God always takes the low. God always takes the one who are messed up. God always takes the one who did the most sins. Can I have somebody raise their hand and be honest? Where are the folks that tell you, man, oh man, I don't know why God wanted me. I have done some stuff. But that is the joy of knowing that we're invited. We're never uninvited. God said, I take you just as you are. I'm not worried about what they did. I'm just worried that I'm just glad they came to me. Listen to me, somebody. The only reason we're doing it is because God always liked to take the folk who are nothing and make them something. Hallelujah. God liked to take the folk who think they can't make it and show them they can make it. Look at our last point. Jesus turned. Not only do they come not to crash the party, but to look for Jesus. Not only do we Want them going. But finally Jesus said, Jesus said, all are invited. They came looking for Jesus. We wanted them going. But Jesus said, they're invited. Look at the text. He said, Simon, he rushed away for it. Do you see this woman? Look at this woman. Here's what he said. I'm telling you, church. God said, next time you want to judge, can you quit looking at the outward appearance and look at a person's heart? Did you hear what I said? 
If you can learn to restore and uplift people, you'll find God blessing your life to no avail. If you can hug somebody smelly, if you can be with someone who does not have anyone else and not judge them for getting where they are, God can turn your life around. I want to help somebody. You want a healing? Go out and try to help somebody who you know is less fortunate. And when you do, watch and make sure and tell God, I see them. They're no longer uninvited guests. If you say they belong in your church, then I'm going to be joyful and grateful for them until they are restored. I'm close, but I would tell you, the devil sure has tricked us into talking about each other and telling other people stuff that we don't even know, stuff we just made up. You don't even really, you don't know where I'm fighting, you don't know my story, you don't know what's going on in my house, and yet you judge me, and I judge you, and the kingdom of God suffers, and the doors close, and nobody comes in. Can you touch, can you do what I did when I was looking at this message? And I'll say this publicly, if I have wronged or hurt anybody, please forgive me. Because I don't want to be guilty of judging you through my eyes. I want to see you through God's eyes. God bless you. See you next week. I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but Living just existing well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.